morning. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm Neil Gutmaker, our pastor here at Norwood United Methodist Church, and it's always a pleasure to be in worship together in our Lord's house. I want to welcome one and all, and I hope that you've had a blessed week. I hope you've had an opportunity to get to know one another just a little bit better this morning, and um, we'll take the time to do so in our fellowship uh, time in the parlor following our services. If you're new to Norwood Church, we have some information about our congregation and its ministries in the narthex, as well as some um, inspirational uh, readings and other uh, materials that uh, might h- help you in your, in your daily lives. I do want to lift up a, uh, a few uh, concerns, uh, as well as opportunities, and um, one is uh, that... Uh, we have a couple of our young people actually that are downtown th- this morning uh, participating in a, uh, a walk uh, for, uh, for organ uh, donators, uh, donors, uh, in special memory of one of their friends who passed uh, through death last year and donated his organs. So, uh, and in light of the, the, um, the tragedy up in Boston this past week, we want to uh, keep all of those persons that are down there and elsewhere in our country um, uh, in our in our prayers, and um, so uh, and also especially those people that had been affected and are affected by the the tragedies in Boston and in Waco uh, in our country, and we we are grateful for those who responded so quickly to those emergencies, and uh, for others who continue uh, and will continue to do so. Uh, also, we want to lift up the, the folks in, in China who, uh, according to the news, were affected by a severe earthquake there just a, a couple of days ago or so. So let's lift all of them up in prayer and pray that God can use this opportunity to, to build some bridges and, and uh, bring us together as a family uh, in God and hopefully in Christ. Is there anyone that's uh, in the hospital or going in the hospital this week? I know we have a number of folks that are on our prayer list, both in the bulletin as well as in the newsletter. A lot of folks have uh, not just been under the weather, but have been fighting some serious uh, illnesses and diseases. Is there anyone else that's going in the hospital this week? Okay. As always, you're encouraged to use a prayer request card and found in the pew rack in front of you if you have a blessing or a concern that you'd like to share with myself. Or the congregation, just fill it out and place it in the offering plate when it comes by this morning. And we'll be glad to to be with you in in prayer or to lift up a a special blessing. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you all this morning. I'm so thankful that uh, more of my family is here today. And it's always a blessing when family is here. Uh, Family's already here. But more families here now. That's, that's what I mean. Uh, I do have one announcement to share with you. The kids stuff sale. The information is in the back if you're interested in this. Uh, outgrown children's clothing and toys. That's what we're collecting. Be a consigner and make some money or just come to shop. We're accepting donations of children's uh, Toys, clothes, movies, games, maternity apparel, uh, and anything else. Books, you're invited. It's May 4th. Anything that's left over will be donated to City Team. And I I think this is a great ministry. So if you have some old kids stuff, we can dig it out and put it to good use. I'm sure there's a child or two that could use some new things. And then if you're looking for more children's clothes, you can always go shop there. And the price is right. It's very good, I hear. So, again, if you're interested, please see uh, either Sally Vickers or there's more information in the back. If you have not already done so, please take a moment and sign the Covenant of Friendship pad found at the end of your pew. If you're a visitor or a newcomer, we invite you to include your full name and address so that we might serve you better. And then when the last person is signed in, tear it out and place it in the offering plate when it comes time for our offering. Now, please stand as able as we join in our responsive call to worship. Jesus has said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am among them. We come together. 
The grace and peace of our risen Lord be with you. Please remain standing as we join in our opening hymns. He is here and all praise to our redeeming Lord. Pages 220 and 221 in your celebration hymnal. be seated. Please join your hearts with me for our opening prayer. Father, we thank you so much that we are able to call you Father, that you have provided a way for us through your Son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we can be your sons and daughters. Sometimes we think of you as father, but we don't think of ourselves as your precious child. Help us to remember that that is exactly what we are. And as children, we can come to you with our deepest hurts and with our greatest joys. And you will weep with us and you will laugh with us. Lord, we thank you so much for that privilege of being a part of your family. We ask that you be with those in, in Boston, in Texas, in China, wherever there is hurt and sorrow in this world, and that you would wrap your arms around them and bind their wounds and heal their hurts. Lord, I pray that this will be a moment when we can all draw closer to one another and to you. Father, help us to, to reach out to those in need and to show them the love that can only come from you. We thank you for each person here today, Lord, each family represented, and I pray that you will speak to us, as you always do, through your servant, Pastor Neil. Lord, help us to take what we hear today and, and believe it in our hearts and take it out to a world that is hurting. Father, we thank you again for this church, for these people. And we pray that you would be honored and glorified in the rest of our service today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us take a moment to individually confess our sins before the Lord.
now let us pray the prayer of Jesus as printed in your bulletin. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hear the good news. Even though we were yet in our sins, Christ came to live and to die for us. That proves God's love for us. For all who truly repent of their sin and ask the Lord's mercy shall receive it. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins and mine are forgiven. Thanks and glory and praise be to our God. Amen and amen. And as forgiven and reconciled children of God, let us stand and offer words and signs of Christ's peace to one another.
Amen. Just so you know, Pastor, that's my favorite hymn. Uh, I want to take a moment to apologize. Uh, as chairperson of the stewardship development team, I was going to share a testimony at the beginning of the service, and I forgot. Um, but I have a, a very brief testimony that I think is appropriate right now to share. Um, as most of you probably know, I am a hospice chaplain, and I spend my day uh, sitting with people who are either dying or with their loved ones who are watching them die. And I was with a woman yesterday, on Friday, and she was an elderly woman in her 90s, and her two of her, two of her daughters were with her. And they said she had been speaking with them earlier in the day and even the day before, but she didn't say anything when I was with her. And I was with her for a good bit of time. And I was talking with the daughters, and the, the patient reached out and took my hand. And she looked at me and she said, God has been so good to me. And that was it. And then... I, of course, affirmed that and said, of course, God is so good, and he loves us so much. And her daughter started to share. And then a couple minutes later, she reached out and took my hand again and said, God has been so good to me. And I thought, what a wonderful testimony. A 90-year-old woman who is dying. And her only words this day were about God and how good he's been to her despite all that she's going through now. And I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Our first scripture reading today comes from Acts chapter 28, verses 11 through 16, then verses 30 to 31. And this can be found on page 1743 of your pew Bibles. After three months, now remember, this is probably the author of Luke who is writing this. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up. And on the following day, we reached Putioli. There we found some brothers who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome. The brothers there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns to meet us. At the sight of these men, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome... Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord, for which we give much thanks. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for that witness, too, that I think was inspired, was given to her through that one by the Holy Spirit. Because though it may not be a typical stewardship message, we thank George for sharing that with us last week. Really, that, that witness through that woman is really very applicable to today's message and what we're considering. Um, so with that, let me read uh, our second scripture reading this morning, which comes from the second letter to Timothy from the second chapter, beginning with the first verse, which you can find on page 1853, or read along in your own Bible if you brought it with you today. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses... Entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his command, 
commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone completes, competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying. The Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. May God add his blessing to the hearing and the reading of the scripture. Amen. Let us bow in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the blessings of this day, for the beauty of your creation that sings praises to you in your spirit of life. We thank you for bringing us together by that spirit into this place. As many are gathered throughout not only our community, our county, our, our state, our country, but throughout this world, acknowledging your presence, draw us closer to you and to one another. As we reflect upon the words that we have heard and others that we will consider. Lord, may our hearts and our minds be good and fertile soil upon which that seed of life is planted. And as it is nurtured by our prayers and our worship and our reflection, our meditation and our application, may that word grow into a mighty tree that bears good fruit by your spirit throughout all the days of our lives. For we ask it for your glory and your kingdom. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Those of you who were here last week might recall that as the Apostle Paul was called by the risen Christ Jesus to spread the gospel, so the church in every generation is called by Jesus to follow the way of Jesus and to fulfill the great commission which he gave to his first apostles to make disciples of every nation and to transform the world in which we live into the kingdom of God by the Spirit of God. We consider, as Randy Frazee does this week, our unity or oneness in Christ as part of the body of Christ. We actually considered that last week in, in worship and in the message. And how challenging and difficult that can be at times. But with the Holy Spirit in Christ's love, we also affirm that we can be who God has created us and intends us to be. That's God's people in this world. But sometimes we might wonder, as others have done before us, if it's really worth it all. We can be assured that when we place ourselves in God's hands, and fulfill God's purpose for us, aligning our lower story lives, so to speak, with God's upper story plan, as Paul and others have done before us, then we will find both challenges and blessings in this life and rewards in the life to come. This week's chapter title of the story is called Paul's Final Days. Perhaps it's a bit unintentional that it's a a little bit confusing or may be confusing because it covers more than just a few days. It actually covers a time period of Paul's imprisonments from his arrival and arrest in Jerusalem in 57 AD until his execution in Rome around 67 AD. So there's really a 10 year span there, as some of you may have already considered. So if you were reading the story or watching the DVD, I wouldn't be surprised if you were wondering if Paul had nine lives. Because when you consider it, in that 10-year span, he made at least uh, three, uh, two missionary journeys. He had already uh, completed um, a couple of them before, if not the third. 
Uh, but even in his, in his time span before that, in his lifetime, he had certainly completed three missionary journeys, along with what is called the shipwreck journey to Rome for one of his uh, uh, imprisonments in Rome. He may have also had a fourth journey, not recorded in Acts, but implied and possibly alluded to in several of his letters, as well as early Christian literature. Some saying that uh, he may have even gone as far as Spain as he had, in, had written and intended to. And a final journey to Rome along with his final imprisonment. Certainly, God had watched over him and brought him through many years and many miles on land and on sea, experiencing many challenges and changes in the course of his lifetime. As expressed in the second letter traditionally attributed to Paul, from Paul to Timothy, written from a Roman dungeon, most likely in his final year of life on this planet, Paul expressed to Timothy, But the Lord stood by at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed to all the Gentiles, that all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Now, most likely he is using a metaphor that we uh, learn from an experience much earlier in the, the story from the Old Testament. From who? Who is rescued from the lion's mouth? Everybody here. Daniel. That's right. So Paul was very well acquainted with the story of Daniel and probably makes that allusion to his own life, to the circumstances when he felt like he was being tossed to the lions. And it might have actually been a, a four. Uh, a, a, a for prophecy, in fact, of the reality that would actually be happening to Christians in the early centuries of the church. They were actually fed to lions in the arenas. Well, it is a witness and a testimony of Paul that God had been with him through all of his trials and all of his persecutions, all of his circumstances. And we know from his, his recorded uh, uh, journeys through the book of Acts and elsewhere, that he escaped death at least on one or two occasions. Likewise, Paul wrote in verses just previously in this letter to Timothy, advising him and, and, and encouraging him, saying, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time has come for my departure. Speaking of his departure from this earthly life. He goes on to say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Here again, Paul uses familiar images to the persons that he addresses, to Timothy as well as to any of the readers of his day, and metaphors to explain and encourage Timothy and also us in our faith and spiritual lives. He says, I have been poured out like a drink offering. Bless you. The time has come for my departure. Perhaps from reading this story or sharing in your small groups or classes or listening to a sermons, you know what a drink offering is. Again, it's an allusion to that earlier part of the, of the story of the, the temple worship still being practiced there in Jerusalem where the drink offering was a, a libation of, of wine poured out upon the altar uh, a, a, along with the, the animal sacrifices. He's most likely referring to his own life, consider his own life as being poured out as an offering along with Christ. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. All of these we should be able to relate with, especially in our modern day and age with, uh, with uh, fighting and, and, and racing and in a very dramatic way, even this this past week with the, the, the great tragedy that happened during the Boston Marathon. 
There was uh, one a clip uh, on the news, perhaps you saw it as well, where um, as those racers, those runners were, were getting near the, the finish line, the one and then a second bomb exploded. A few that were very close that were watching the race were even killed, even a young boy. Many others were blown off their feet even while they were racing. One man, a 70-something-year-old man who had been running in that Boston Marathon, after he had been knocked on his feet, perhaps he didn't know the full extent of the explosion, perhaps he didn't know it was gone, but what did he do? He got up and he finished the race. He finished that run. Many others came to the help, to the rescue of so many who had been injured in that situation as well. And here is the hope which Paul has and an example for all of us to follow. To continue that race, even to the very end, even though we might be knocked off of our feet, and to help those others who are are there with us, whether they're running the race or even just as, as bystanders. Paul says, There is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to those who have longed for his appearing, referring to the appearance, the second coming of Christ. As Paul looks back over his 30 years as an apostle of the Lord, he continues with the same figure of speech, the running of a race. He uses a metaphor of the wreath that would be placed upon the winner of the race. As the NIV study Bible notes, Paul could be referring when he says a crown of righteousness. It could be referring to a a crown given as a reward for a righteous life in Christ or a crown consisting of righteousness or a crown given righteously or justly by a righteous judge, Jesus Christ. Whatever the case, perhaps all three of these, Paul has accomplished what God had set him apart to do. His words and his life are now a reflection or fulfillment of words that he wrote earlier to the believers at Rome many years before. He said to them, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice In the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Could you imagine that? We also rejoice, not just in the good times and the good things and the blessings, but we also rejoice, Paul says, in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which he has given us. So if you ever wonder whether it's really worth it or not, if you ever have those moments of doubt or despair, be comforted, be assured, be strengthened. Because God is with you and that you can, with Paul, answer with a resounding yes. Yes, it is worth it. As Mark Anderson of Pennsylvania shared with readers of the Upper Room some time ago, life beats us up. There's that fight metaphor again. Sometimes we're like, we feel like we're in the ring, you know, uh, and doing all we can just not to to get our, our face pummeled or be thrown to the mat. Life beats us up. As hard as we may try to be good and brave, life continues to throw obstacles in our path. We sometimes think that trying to live a righteous life will protect us from pain and suffering. Perhaps sometimes it, it does, I would say. But that's not always the case. Because sometimes it puts us in in positions where we need to struggle for what is right and what is just and what is good. We pray that like a genie in a bottle, sometimes God will grant us happiness. However, that is not the God of the Bible. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is within us, but we also live in the kingdom of humanity. Remember, God has not taken away our free will 
And sometimes human beings can do terrible things to one another. Influenced, I would say, by Satan himself or his dominions. God does not promise to deliver us from all suffering, much of which is caused by our inhumanity to one another or by our general neglect of the resources we have to improve the world. God does promise to be with us in every second, every minute, every long hour. We live our lives in relationship with God. Our having a personal relationship with God made possible through Jesus Christ is God's will and shaping purpose in our lives. As Christians, we are called to accept that joy comes from living each day in this world, in the here and now, and even through our personal sufferings. Remember the life of Jesus himself, who experienced suffering even to the point of death. A life that was filled with blessing and joy that he shared with others. And even when he felt abandoned, he did not stop blessing others by forgiving or asking God's forgiveness for others. Anderson goes on to say that we have the strength to overcome our fears and bear our pain only through God's covenant relationship with us. Remember the earlier parts of the story, the covenant that was mentioned, the covenants as far back as, as a covenant with Noah, his promise of, of never destroying the earth by a flood again, his covenant made with Abraham to be a blessing to many nations, or his, his, his offspring would be a, a blessing to many nations and he would have more descendants than the stars in the sky, and the covenant he made with others to that new covenant that he has made with us in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus, before his crucifixion and his resurrection, said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives it do I give to you. This peace reflects the will of God for us. So whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's disease or persecution, whether it's just simply lacking necessities, or whether it's violent acts of terror, God is with us and can sustain us. God's Spirit in Christ and in us can give us peace and bring peace to others. One of the things that greatly impressed me in reading through the story and the related chapters of the Bible this, uh, for this time period in the life of Paul, were the many ways in which God used Paul's circumstances, often of them very difficult ones, perhaps even causing them to fulfill God's upper story plan for Paul and purpose for Paul. And this would not have been possible if Paul gave up, if Paul did not have an open and willing attitude to align his story, his life, with God's story. One great example was the voyage to Rome. After he had been arrested the first time in Jerusalem, as recorded in the final two chapters of the book of Acts, Paul was apparently not treated too harshly, perhaps because he was a Roman citizen. Anyway, after the first day's voyage up the coast of Palestine, He was allowed to go to the house of some friends when they landed and they poured it in Sidon, about some 50 or 60 miles north of of Galilee. He was allowed to uh, depart from the boat and go to the house of some friends to meet his, his own needs. And he did not try to escape. He came back to the to the boat, boarded it, and they they continued on their journey along the east and the north of the island of Cyprus. Now Cyprus is uh just a bit south of, of modern-day Turkey and a bit west of, of modern-day uh, Lebanon and, and, and Syria. And so they, uh, they continued along the east and the north of the island of Cyprus, where the winds were, were not as strong. And they, they landed in Myra in the province of Lycia, which is part of modern-day Turkey. And they changed there they changed boats in the harbor onto a boat that was from Alexandria in Egypt and was perhaps better equipped to go across the, the, the major part of the Mediterranean Sea. 
Well, after facing rough waters due to the changing seasons, Paul warned them not to sail on. But they did anyway, because the harbor was unsuitable to stay for the winter. Paul goes from being a victim, a captive, if you really, under arrest, to really being a victor in a sense, as the ship is blown off course by the hurricane winds of a nor'easter. Yes, they have them in the Mediterranean too. Let's take a look, if you will, at the rest of that story that we have from, from Acts 27 and 28. Beginning with the 13th verse. Feel free to read along with me or, or visualize it, imagine it in your head. It's really an amazing story. It's one that's gripping to me because there are so many changes that take place. And we realize how God, you can really see how God can use what might have been an utter, uh, an utter travesty for Paul, where he might have just, you know, crawled up in fear for his own life, how God was able to transform that experience so that Paul was used to even further still proclaim the gospel and, and bless others and keep the ship from total destruction. Here's what it says. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought that they had obtained what they wanted. In other words, they, they set sail, even though Paul had warned them not to set sail. Um, they went ahead and did it anyway, under the, under the advice of the, of the pilot of the boat, hoping to reach the city of Phoenix, the town of Phoenix, uh, along the, the uh, western, southwestern side of the island of Crete. Still part of the same, still part of the same island, but some 60 or 70 miles away. Well, <clears throat> as they, as they did, a gentle south wind began to blow. They thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed an anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. But before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the nor'easter, northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along as we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda. We were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of, of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, because it was so cloudy, they couldn't even see stars at night or sun during the day for all the, the clouds and probably the, the rain that came down with it. And the storm continued raging. We finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. For last night an angel of the God whose, whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Do you get that? Paul was a prisoner. He was under arrest. They held him captive. And yet, even though they didn't listen to what he advised them, now the angel was saying, look, this ship is going to be destroyed. But you have charge of those people who are holding you. And because of you, they will be preserved. That challenge would be turned into an opportunity. Because why? Because Paul was allowing himself to align himself with God's upper story even to eventually go before Caesar. 
And by the way, let me back up for just a second, as I did at the early service. Paul wouldn't have even been on this voyage if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. When he was, when he was uh, held in, in Jerusalem and in Caesarea by, by the Roman authorities there, um, after being accused by the, the leaders of the, high, the Sanhedrin, the high Jewish council, of, of instigation of a, of a riot and, and of uh, trying to overthrow Rome, when they heard his case, they said, they came to the conclusion that there's no, he, there, he's not trying to incite any riot. He's not being rebellious. In fact, they said <clears throat> at the end of chapter 26, Agrippa said to Festus, who were the, the two uh, Roman leaders there, they said, this man had, could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Do you get that? He wouldn't have even been on this voyage if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. But he did so as part of God's upper story plan. And now he finds himself tossed and turned, seeming like, like there, is no, there is no hope. And yet, an angel of God was sent to him to give him words of not only of hope, but of peace and assurance and encouragement. The angel said, so keep up your courage, men. Right? Paul said rather to the men, so keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. And then on the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. And a short time later, they took soundings again and found that it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, some of the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea. They were going to try to get off before it wrecked, pretending that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. But then Paul said to the centurion, the Roman centurion, the officer and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and it fell away. So now they don't even have a lifeboat, okay? Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food for you will need it to survive. Does that strike a bell by any chance? Remember what happened to Elijah, the prophet, as he was wandering and he was trying to, to flee from, from uh, Jezebel and, and those that were after him? And he was wandering, you know, in the desert and, and he had just about given up. He had collapsed because he hadn't eaten anything. And what happened? An angel of the Lord came to him and said, what? Elijah, get up and eat. And the angel had food there. Enough for Elijah. And he said, because you will need your strength to go to where I'm sending you. Well, in a similar manner, with what little food they had left, Paul tells them, you need to eat because you will need your strength. And then... Now I urge you, he says, to take some food, for you will need it to survive, for not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. And after he said this, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God. You see what God is doing there? He's taking that dire need that they had and all of their exhaustion and all that they had lost and giving thanks to God for what they did have the provision that God had given them. He did that in front of them all. And to the what God? The one God, right? They had, they had images of, of a God on, their, on their, their boat. That wasn't the God that Paul was, was saying that would, that would be with them and sustain them. No, that boat was going to be destroyed. But the God who was with them in spirit would provide them what they needed 
including their own salvation, their own safety. And they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. And all together, there were 276 of us on board, Luke writes. And when they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the boat or the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. What little food they had left, they got rid of. Why? They didn't need it anymore. Because God had provided and would give them the strength that they needed. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. And cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the anchors. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and it ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move. And the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent them from escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest were to get there on planks or pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached the land in safety. You see, God had provided what they needed. And as many times as they thought that they could, you know, do what, what would survive, would help them survive, God told them just the opposite through Paul. And God provided for them and brought them to safety. And once safely on shore, we found out <clears throat> that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us an unusual kindness. Imagine that. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, a viper, a snake driven out by the heat, fastened itself to his hand as if he didn't have enough problems, right? He's trying to gather some wood, start a fire. A snake comes out, bites him and is holding on to his hand. When the islanders saw that this thing, you would think Paul would say, okay, God, come on, right? When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer. For though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. You see how quick it is for people to judge. They don't know Paul. They don't know, you know, what's going on here. All they think of, well, is he got bit by a snake, he must be a murderer. And now he's going to get his justice. Now he's going to die from the, from the snake bite. How easy it is for us also to, to judge too quickly. What well, we don't understand. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. So what did the people do now? Well, the people ex expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing that nothing unusual happened to him, they changed their minds. And they said he was a god. You see, it's got to be one or the extreme or the other with, with people sometimes. That's the way we are as human beings very often. We're e so easily to judge others or, we're easy, or we want to put them way up on a, on a pedestal. When in fact, we are just human beings, children of God, created in God's image. And if we allow that image to shine forth from us in Christ, God can do amazing things through us. Listen to what happens now. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and for three days entertained us with hospitality. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer placed his hands upon him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick of the island came and were cured. And they honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. Well, we know the story goes on for a while there, and many other things happened to Paul. But you see, that's just one example of what God can do in our lives if we just allow God to work in and through our lives. If we seek with our hearts and with our minds to discern God's will and God's purpose and God's plan, that no matter what the circumstances are, 
that God is at work and we can be blessed and be a blessing for others. I know from personal experience that we too may find ourselves tossed or challenged by life circumstances. But the good news is that Christ has made the way. The Holy Spirit is ever with us in this life. There is grace, peace, joy, blessings, and hope for us in this life and in the life to come. Find faith in Christ or keep the faith that you have. Let the loving arms of God enfold you and strengthen you to fight the good fight, to run the race of life to the very finish, so that you too may receive the crown of righteousness and eternal life. Amen and amen. Let us bow in prayer. Gracious and wonderful God, help us to fathom or comprehend the mystery and the power of your great love at work in our lives. For though things may seem tragic or discouraging or desperate or without hope, Lord, you are the hope in our lives. You are ever with us. And your purpose and your plan might be accomplished in and through us as we seek your way your grace, your spirit, your love, and your strength day by day. Just as you have shown us and proved to us in and through Jesus Christ and made that way a reality. Lord, help us to remain faithful to you and to one another in Christ and to reach out to so many in this world that do not know you, that are discouraged, that are in despair, that are seeking hope and peace and love in their lives. Lord, be especially with those that we have thought of or named in this time already. For so many who are suffering from illness, disease, disaster, tragedy, violence. Be with those who offer themselves as instruments of grace, responding in love unconditionally with bravery or courage. Be with those that come to our hearts or to our minds at this time and hear our prayers for them, O oh Lord. And be with all the peoples of this world Bless and keep those who make for peace. And open every heart and mind to the influence of your Holy Spirit. For all these things we ask and pray to your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. As God has indeed blessed us in so many ways, let us share of ourselves and all that we have.